Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Ali Kujuri, those of you who do not know me, and, and I'm, I'm a child professor at this engineering uh, 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 department of uh, uh, engineering science, and uh, on behalf of the school, uh, the School of Science and Technology, and the Department of uh, uh, Engineering Science, I would like to uh, welcome you all to this uh, eighth lecture of the series, and in fact, uh, it's the 90, believe it or not, it's the 95th lecture since we started the lecture series in 2006. And in fact, that's the time uh, when uh, the department, the bachelor's program started here. Uh, I would like also to uh, thank uh, um, Keysight Technologies, uh, formerly Agilent Technologies, uh, who supported this uh, lecture series since the start. Uh, I apologize for uh, for the delay because uh, you know we needed to have the power cord here uh, and then also the adapter uh, for the speaker. Uh, before I uh, uh, introduce our uh, uh, speaker, uh, let me mention that uh, uh, there are uh, two things I've got to say. One is that the uh, pizza that you ordered is going to arrive at. Uh, that's a very good part of it. It's a very delicious pizza, I can promise on that. And then it's gonna arrive at 5.30. And then uh, the uh, next uh, talk is, uh, yeah, the next talk uh, is, is uh, by uh, titled Optical Filters and Their Application by Dr. Uh, uh, Robert Sargent. He's a director uh, and uh, uh, of the R&D uh, optical security and performance product at, at uh, JDSU. Uh, the, uh, our guest speaker for today is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Omid uh, uh, Momeni, and the title of his talk is uh, Terahertz and Millimeter Wave Signal Generation, Synthesis and Amplification. Reaching the Fundamental Limits. Dr. Omid Momeni received his Bachelor of Science degree from Isfahan University of Technology in Isfahan, Iran, and Master of Science degree from University of Southern California, Los Angeles, uh, and the PhD degree from Cornell University, Ithaca, New York, in electrical engineering in 2002 2006 and 2011, respectively. He joined the faculty of uh, electrical and computer engineering department at UC Davis in 2011. He was a visiting professor in electrical engineering and computer science department, UC Irvine, from 2011 to 2012. From 2006 to 2004 to six, he was with the Jet Propulsion uh, Laboratory and NASA uh, as, a, uh, as an RFIC designer. His research interests include millimeter wave and terahertz integrated circuits and systems. Professor Momeni is the recipient of the best PhD thesis award from Cornell ECE program in 2011 the best student paper award at IEEE workshop on microwave passive circuits and filters in 2010, the Cornell University Jacobs uh, Fellowship in 2007, and uh, finally the NASA and JPL uh, Fellowship in 2003. So let's just give him a hand. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here uh, talking. Uh, I'm guessing all of you are undergrad students, or maybe a couple of masters. Is that right? Or yeah. is different? Okay, mostly undergrad. So, uh, so terahertz and millimeter wave. So, the, 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 the talk that I'm going to have today is mostly on uh, high frequency circuit design. And by high frequency, it's everybody talks about high frequency, but you have to define what high frequency is, right? So that's why I'm putting the terahertz and millimeter wave, which are uh, defined, and I will define it throughout the talk. 
so just, just to give you some uh, um, feelings of what those frequencies are, uh, you can just look at your cell phones and look at the Wi-Fi uh, routers. These are the frequencies around 1, 2, 4, 5 gigahertz. And uh, the ones that I'm going to talk about is above 30 gigahertz. So, and those specifically the blocks that I'm going to talk about are around 100, 200, 400, and 500 gigahertz. And believe it or not, uh, today in today's technologies, you can have all these circuits in an IC and in a CMOS IC. Uh, to, uh, to actually uh, make it even better. So, this is the outline of my talk. I'll start with some motivation on why do we even need to go to those high frequencies? Why can't we just live with these simple uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 gigahertz to lower frequencies? Why we need to go higher and higher? The next one is, and, and the rest of the talks are on different building blocks that we try to make using uh, CMOS transistors. The first one is a traveling wave signal source. Uh, the second one is a high, high power uh, terahertz oscillator. And we here in the second one, we talk about fundamental um, uh, theories behind uh, this block and why actually we could actually do this in a CMOS using a CMOS transistor. The third one is our recent work on a frequency synthesizer. This is the highest frequency uh, synthesizer in, in silicon and I think in any uh, on-chip and integrated, circuit, uh, integrated technology. The next part is on amplifiers, uh, fundamental basics behind the amplifiers and how can we actually have a high gain and high power amplifier at higher frequency. And the last part of my talk is on a passive uh, filter but with a completely new way of looking into filter design. So in all these sources, in all these blocks, I don't want you guys to uh, be lost in the details and the theories. I don't want you to do that. I just want to give you the idea. And on most of these, the idea itself is a very simple idea. It's the using and the, the basically the putting this idea to work that is hard and, and it takes some time. But all of these problems starts with the idea that is really simple to follow. And I would like you guys to see this and, and, and see that basically you can, you can come up with a very small idea and make your circuit work and make your, your, your block work or your system work very easily. So let me start with the, first, with the first part of my talk, which is the motivation part. So why higher frequencies? So if you look at your cell phones, uh, the frequency is around uh, 1 to gigahertz. And the problem is, it's really congested these days. Why? Because everybody wants to have a cell phone, everybody wants to talk, and using this, you need to have a very limited bandwidth for each channel, for each user. And this is the bandwidth that actually makes, your, uh, makes, makes the data communication really, really uh, uh, limited. So if you look at the Shannon theory, uh, theory uh, uh, equation, you can see that the capacity of your channel is basically a direct function of your bandwidth. And the bandwidth at lower frequencies are really, really small. So in order to increase the bandwidth, there is no way other than going to higher and higher frequencies. So this is the first thing that people are talking about these days on 5G. So for so far, you have LTE, you have 4G, and people are thinking about 5G. And what is 5G? One candidate for 5G is to put the uh, carrier frequency around 27, 26 gigahertz. Some people talk about 60 and 70 gigahertz, and people are still debating on uh, which frequency they need to work on, which, which frequency is more, um, more applicable. So this is the first reason why we need to go to higher and higher frequency. The second reason is basically you have less interference. And the reason is the the absorption of the air is really is higher for higher and higher frequency. So if you are in the same distance, you get more power in one gigahertz than let's say 60 or 70 gigahertz. So you basically have more isolation and therefore you have less interference. When you have less interference, FCC can if the FCC gets actually will allow you to send higher power. And when you send higher power, you can have higher <coughs> SNR, signal to noise ratio. And for the same reason, you have isolation. So you can actually have smaller channels, and you can use the frequency even more. 
So this is another good part about higher frequencies. The other good part of even higher frequency than, let's say, 60, 70 gigahertz, we we're talking about 200, 300, 500, and up to 1 terahertz, is that they, have, they actually have very interesting features. They pass through fogs, they pass through clothings, and if you have been in one of these uh, scanners uh, in the airport, you actually see that you have these new scanners coming in, not new, like a couple of years is out, but these are around 30 gigahertz scanners, and the new ones that are coming out are 90 gigahertz, and they're thinking about 140 gigahertz, 240 gigahertz. They're basically increasing the frequency to get a better, better and better resolution. And why are they using these frequencies? Is because of the unique signatures. The unique signatures uh, can actually help them find concealed weapons or whatever that they're looking for in the scanners. And the last one is basically smaller structures. As the frequency goes higher and higher, the antenna size goes smaller and smaller, fundamentally goes smaller and smaller, the transmission lines go smaller and smaller. So you can actually put the whole circuit into one small chip. Okay? So these are the applications, the main applications that people are looking for at these frequencies now. Let me first define the terahertz frequencies. People define the terahertz frequency to be start from 300 gigahertz all the way to 3 terahertz. And whatever between 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz, they call it millimeter wave. So this is the uh, standard definition of these words, these frequency bands, basically. So the first application is imaging. So the imaging is used in, in detection of concealed weapons, as, as I talked about. Sometimes they use it for cancer diagnosis and for wave, uh, wafer uh, inspection. This is for imaging. You can also use these for compact range radars. The people use it for uh, uh, FMCW radars and, and all sorts of other radars to get a higher and higher resolution. As the frequency goes higher, the resolution gets better. And of course, high data rate communication that we just talked about. If you want to have a 5G, if you want to have higher data rate, you need to go higher and higher frequencies. This picture here is actually one of the pictures that we took in our lab. And it shows, it's basically as imaging at 240 gigahertz. And you can see that it shows the concealed metallic object in a wallet very easily. This is another interesting and cool picture to show you the differences between different frequency bands. If you look at the visible band, which is basically optics visible, you see basically everything, right? You see the beard, you see hair, you see the, you, you basically see everything. <coughs> and in infrared, you actually see the same thing, but with, with the temperature information, right? So you see this glass, you see hairs, you see beards and everything. But look at the millimeter wave part. What is the difference between the millimeter wave part and the other parts? <coughs> Any ideas? Yes? He's going through his, his glasses. It's going a little, yeah, a little bit through the glasses. And what else? The important part. It's the hair, right? It goes through the hair. So you, you, you actually can see the shape of his head, right? And the face doesn't have any beard. So it passes through the beard, and none of these can pass through uh, the beard. So this is one of the interesting features that I was talking about. So to get a good picture, to get a, you have a good imaging, you actually need high power sources. And why is that? You need to send the signal to the object, receive it, or send it to the sig signal to the object, and look at the transmission of the object. To do that, transmit transmission of the signal. To do that, we need a high power source. But the problem is, this frequency band is too high for electronics, and it's too low for optics. You can clearly see in this graph, which is uh, the graph of power versus frequency, in any technology, basically, this is optical technology and this is electronic sources, you can see that as the frequency goes higher and higher, close to the terahertz frequency, power drops dramatically. And optical sources, as you are at lower and lower frequency, the power drops. So it's really hard to generate power at these frequencies. And this has a fundamental reason. It's because most of these uh, technologies, they're basically fundamentally incapable of doing that. Transistors basically offer no power at gain above F max, which is the f maximum frequency in which the transistor can work on. And at the optical side, we have optical side, we have the same problem. So this is the graph of 
solid state, uh, basically silicon oscillators, uh, before 2011. So this is when uh, people were not really looking at higher power, high power generation in, in silicon technologies. But when you look at the same graph today, you see major improvements at high, high power signal generation at these frequencies, 300 gigahertz, 400, and 500 gigahertz. So this is the band that silicon sources have been booming, basically. People are thinking about uh, generating power using silicon at these frequencies. So in this talk, I'm going to go over the techniques some of these works used to basically generate this kind of power at higher and higher frequencies. There are other sorts of applications for high, high uh, terahertz uh, systems. Uh, the most important part ones are spectroscopy systems. It's basically using for uh, biology and molecular uh, spectroscopy and chemical spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is basically sending the signal to a, to a matter, to a subject, or whatever uh, device you have under the test, and look at the transmission. And by analyzing the transmission, you can actually tell what kind of, what kind of material it is. So this, is, this has a wide range of use in, in, in biology and chemistry. Remote sensing and, and, of course, drug detection, food quality control, and other sort of uh, applications at these um, uh, frequencies. And for all of these, you need, you need a very good quality factor filter uh, in your system. But the problem is, if you look at the passive systems and the passive filters, you can see that the quality factor of this filter, let's say this is a butterfly filter, I, I hope that you guys know about different class of filters. But this is a very simple uh, and classic uh, filter called Butterworth filter. And you can see that the quality factor of filter is around 4. The quality factor of the inductor is around 6. It actually tells you that the quality factor of the filter is fundamentally limited to the quality factor of each component. If you have a low quality factor component, you cannot make a high quality factor filter from those components, right? So this is fundamentally, and you can actually fundamentally show that this is the case. You're limited to the quality factor of your components. So what we want to go, what we are doing is, is, is it possible to overcome this limit using passive networks? And if yes, how, 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 how we can do that? So these are different blocks that I'm going to show in this uh, talk. I have multiple uh, blocks in signal generation part and signal detection part. We have, we're, we're going to talk about filters. In the synthesis part, we are going to talk about multipliers and PLLs. And in amplification part, we are going to talk about an amplifier at uh, terahertz and the rate frequencies. OK. So let's move on to the first part of uh, my talk. Uh, and this is a doubler. So, let me start with the idea that actually started this, this project. All of us know about Doppler effect, right? What is the Doppler effect? Doppler effect is when a source, the sound of basically source of sound moves towards you, towards somebody who is hearing, you actually hear higher frequency than the frequency that is actually generated by, by the source, right? So I was thinking that is it possible to have a low frequency signal source and somehow move towards it to be able to increase the frequency, basically generate power at higher frequencies. Is that possible to do in electrical domain? Because this is like voice, right? How, how we can, how we can do same, the same thing in, in electronics. So the first thing that uh, came in my mind was, why can't I just replicate the same exact thing that is happening there, right? And with that, I looks at the transmission line. So if you, if you look at the voice and its sound propagating in the air, air is basically a medium for transmission, right? What is a good medium for transmitting signals? <clears throat> it could be air again, right? Or it could be an electronic or electric medium, which is a transmission line, right? So this transmission line is basically a medium for the signal to travel in. So let's say your signal source is somewhere here. Is generating the signal, signal is transferring and transmitting into the transmission line, right? Now, here, I'm basically replic replicating the ear. How, how can I do that? It's just switching on and off as this thing moves 
from left to right, this signal moves from right to left and turns these signals on and off. So you're basically making a, a, a listener to move toward the signal source. And then at here, you will basically add all the signals to the output. So this is, you're basically replicating the Doppler effect in electrical domain. So is it possible to create higher frequency at F0 over here? Our simulation shows <coughs> yes, it's possible. You're actually hearing or you're sensing higher frequency than the signal source. But this is a little bit hard to implement, right? You need two sources, you need another sources, you need switches, which is not a good idea at higher frequency. It's really hard to make switches at higher frequency. So we, we were talking about a better way of doing this, and we, we basically proposed this one. And at the end of the day, we actually end up, yeah, so this is how, how this, this thing actually works. And at the end of the day, we end up having this idea, which you have two signals traveling from left to right and right to left. And these transistors create the harmonics coming out. And at the end here, you are actually having higher frequency than the input signal. And this is a better way of, uh, again, the better way of uh, implementing this. You're basically having one signal source on the bottom. It's two signals go at the top, and it reflects back. So if you want to find out what, how this thing is similar to the one before that, you can actually see these two signals going to two different directions. And with that, you can actually replicate the same idea in, in a signal, in a, in a system. So this is basically mathematically how you can write down uh, the, the output frequency signal. And this is the actual signal we, we implemented in an IC. So these lines are transmission lines. These are CMOS transistors at the four corners. And this is the signal source here. So you have the power coming in. It goes back to this common mode node, it reflects back, and you basically um, you collect the signal at the output in the center. So there, there are some details that I'm skipping here, but I just want to show you the actual chip we designed using this idea. And we actually measured it using probe stations and waveguide uh, probes and power meters and mixers basically to mix down the signal so you can actually, you can, uh, you can actually uh, measure it. And this power setup is basically from 220 years to 280 years. So we measured this <coughs> signal source, and this is the measured, uh, measured uh, results. You can see that we can achieve high output power of around minus 6 or 7 dBm at the output, and a good conversion loss uh, for this uh, signal multiplier. And this is uh, basically the bandwidth is from, this is at 244 GHz. This, this results at 240 GHz, but the measured results is from 230 GHz all the way to 260 GHz. OK, so this is the first block. Let's move on uh, to the second one. Yes? Uh, what was your original frequency of the input signal? So it's, it's a doubler, basically. So uh, you, if, if the signal is at 220 gigahertz, your input is around 100, 110 gigahertz. It doubles, multiplied by two. But in that structure, you can always have even harmonic multiplication. So you can have multiplied by four. But of course, because the, if harmonic number goes up, then the output power goes down. Any other question on that? OK. So let's move on to the next one, which is high power terahertz and millimeter wave oscillators and the way that we approach this problem on how to generate high power. So before going into the details here, I just want to talk about some fundamental limits and fundamental questions. <clears throat> so the one thing that came in mind was uh, why most of the oscillators that I see in the literature have the oscillation frequency which is much less than the F max of the transistor. If you don't know Fmax, Fmax is basically a fundamental figure I've made for any device that defines if the, if, the, if, the, if the transistor is active or passive. They call it maximum oscillation frequency because if you have a passive uh, block, passive transistor, you cannot make oscillation happen with it, right? You cannot cancel any loss. So before Fmax, the transistor is active. So why the oscillators are all way below Fmax? So why can't we have oscillators very close to the Fmax of the transistor. And these Fmax that I'm talking about in silicon, you can have Fmaxes are 250 gigahertz, 300 gigahertz, right? 
But I didn't at that at that time when I was designing these blocks, I couldn't see any oscillator, fundamental oscillator, oscillating at 250 gigahertz. So my question was why? The other question I had was <clears throat> if I have a comp if I have a structure, uh, let's say a cross-coupled oscillator or a Colpitz oscillator. I hope you guys are familiar with these names. But the cross-coupled oscillator is the most widely used uh, oscillator in industry. Everybody uses Colpitz uh, cross-coupled oscillator. And my question was, if you have a cross-coupled oscillator, what is the maximum frequency you can achieve using a cross-coupled oscillator? What is it? Where is it coming from? So this is another question I have. And if I have a device with a specific Fmax, how can I reach Fmax? What kind of topology do I need to use to reach higher and higher frequency of oscillation? These are the questions. So just to make it more clear, I, I picked an IBM 130 nanometer CMOS process transistor. <clears throat> It's a CMOS transistor. If you measure the Fmax in simulator, in cadence, you can actually see the Fmax is around 174 gigahertz, right? OK. And this is the cross couple oscillator that I was talking about. So I, I picked those transistors. I put it in a cross couple oscillator, right, like this. And I put two inductors, which are completely ideal, no loss associated with the inductors, right? And I tried to reduce the size of the inductors to increase the frequency of the oscillation, right? So I try to do that, and everything's lossless, right? I don't have any loss in this circuit, except the transistors itself, if they have any loss. And interestingly, the highest frequency that I could achieve using these structures was 120 gigahertz. This is far less than 174 gigahertz. So again, the question is, why? Why is it that I cannot go higher and higher frequency using the very simple oscillator and I cannot reach the Fmax of the transistor? So to solve this problem, I looked into the device itself. So this is the part that I want you guys to look at and, 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 and to take something out of. So I didn't really do anything complicated. I just took the transistor. <coughs> like this, right? It's a two-port device, right? I wrote down the power that is going into the device as a function of the voltages and the currents of the two sides, right? This is a two-port analysis, right? It's not really complicated, right? And I try to work with these equations a little bit and to try to find out the power that is flowing into or out, out of the transistor as a function of the y parameters of the device, y11, y22, y12, y21, and the voltage gain and the voltage phase shift of the device. So A is a voltage gain, phi is a voltage phase shift of the device. I see how this power, the, the real power coming out of the device, associates itself with these, uh, these uh, A and phi, the voltage gain and voltage phase shift of the device. Okay. <coughs> So I could actually write down this equation, which is a normalized real power coming out of the device as a function of the y parameters. This g11 is the real part of y11, and all the y parameters, and especially a and phi. Now, if I want to increase this real power coming out of the device, do I have any choice on the y parameters? Do I? It's a y parameter of the device, right? So the device is given to me. I cannot change that, right? I can change the biasing a little bit, but that doesn't really change the, the story very much. So I have the y parameters that I cannot change. The only thing that I can change is the voltage gain and the voltage phase shift around the device. Those are external forces. I cannot change I can change that. So if I try to find out the optimum A and phi for this equation to maximize this normalized power, it's something like this. So you actually can find and optimize A and phi to maximize the power coming out of the device. So this is basically the maximum normalized power using these optimum numbers uh, for the device. And now, interestingly, if I equate this normalized power to zero, this is exactly where my Fmax happens. What is it? How can I make this zero? The real power should be zero, right? So if the real power is zero, Fmax is there. That's the Fmax. That's the exact frequency in which Fmax happens. So what does this tell me? This tells me if I want to reach Fmax, 
which means if I want to reach this part of the equation, I need to create the optimum conditions for the device, right? And those optimum conditions are the phase and the gain of the device, the voltage gain of the device. <clears throat> and this is exactly what I did. The interesting thing about ring oscillators is that by changing the number of stages, you can change the phase shift between the gate and the drain of the device, right? You can actually change that phase shift. If you have two stages, the phase shift between gate and drain should be 180 degrees. If it's three stages, the phase shift between gate and drain should be 120 degrees because the phase shift around the loop should, should be 360 gigahertz. This is the fundamental conditions for the oscillators. So by changing the number of stages, I basically manipulate the phase shift around uh, the device itself. So if I do this for <clears throat> that the same 130 gigahertz uh, 130 nanometer CMOS transistor that I was just talking about, I can find the optimum conditions, the optimum gain, and the optimum phase shift as a function of frequency. If I want to reach this, let's say, f max of the transistor, the optimum conditions for the gain is 1, around 1.1, 1.2, and the optimum phase shift is around 120, here, 120 degrees. So that tells me if you really want to reach the f max of the transistor, you need to force the gain of the transistor, the voltage gain of the transistor to be around one point something, and the phase shift should be around 120. And this is exactly what I did. <clears throat> I created a three-stage ring oscillator, which creates a 120 degree phase shift between gate and drain, which is very close to the optimum phase that I need around the transistor. And the gain in any ring oscillator between gate and drain is always one. So even the gain, the voltage gain, is also close to the optimum conditions that I need. So these are the ones that I actually fabricated. And these numbers of effects that I'm giving you, they're very raw numbers. When you put the layout and everything, these effects starts to come down. But even with those numbers, we could achieve a fundamental oscillation frequency at around 121 gigahertz at 130 nanometer. And the measured effects for these are 135 gigahertz. So you can see that we are pretty close to the F max of the transistor. Why? Because instead of culpits, instead of a cross couple oscillator, we just added another, another transistor to the ring. We just made a three stage oscillator. Nothing really, yes, complicated. Could you define measured F max? Yes, so this measured F max is when you pick a device and you try to measure it using only your, own, mm -hmm. uh, uh, your own network analyzer. Or right. the other, the other uh, way of doing this was this is, this is how we, we reported this. Okay. Was we actually did all the EM simulations around the device. Yeah. And when we bring out all the layers from the gate and drain and everything, we just put the port there and we try to find out the Fmax that way. The Fmax of 174 gigahertz is when you, nothing is connected to it. This is when everything's connected to it. Okay. <coughs> and you can see the output power is also uh, relatively high, around minus 3.5 dBm. So these, these numbers are still the highest fundamental oscillators using that technology, 130 nanometer. OK, so this is great. Uh, you can have fundamental oscillators very close to the Fmax. You can actually do it. You can simulate it. But what if you want to even go higher frequencies? Because the Fmax of, let's say, silicon technology is 250, 300 gigahertz. But what we need is 500 gigahertz signals, 600 gigahertz signal, higher, higher, and higher. How can we actually reach that uh, oscillation? One way to do this is using harmonics. <clears throat> All these transistors that we're talking about, they're nonlinear. And using the nonlinearity, you can actually produce harmonics using the fundamental frequency. Let's say you have a fundamental oscillation at 100 gigahertz, then you can extract the third harmonic, or the fourth harmonic, or the sixth harmonic. And all of these are 600, 500, 300 gigahertz. They're very high frequencies, right? But the problem is harmonics are really challenging to work with. And one of the problems is it's low power. When you have a fundamental swing of one, two volts, when you look at the harmonics, it's one millivolt or two millivolts, right? So we were thinking about this, and we were, we were, we were, we were, we were thinking if it's possible to use the same theory that we just talked about in harmonic oscillators. And clearly, you can do that. We went back to the better technology, 65 nanometers uh, CMOS process, and we plot the, fund, uh, the optimum conditions A and phi for the same transistor. So here, we actually wanted to reach around 450 gigahertz. 
and wanted to use the third harmonic. <clears throat> so if I'm going to use the third harmonic, and if I want to reach 450 gigahertz, what should be the fundamental frequency? 150 gigahertz, right? So at 150 gigahertz, we found the optimum conditions for the device, and we tried to give the transistor those optimum conditions to get the highest possible swing at fundamental frequency. And believe it or not, the higher the fundamental oscillation you have, the better the harmonic you have. So using the same approach, we can increase the swing of the, of the fundamental frequency and increase uh, the harmonic power. <clears throat> okay, oh, uh, something I forgot to say. So here, if you look at here, the optimum gain is 0.5 and the optimum phase is 160 gigahertz. In order to extract the third harmonic, we need to have a three stage ring oscillator. In a three stage ring oscillator, the third harmonic that coming out of which is coming out of each device would be in phase in the common mode. You can actually write down the phase relationship, and it's really easy to see that in a three stage ring, you can collect the third harmonic here at the common mode node. But the problem is. In a trio stage, as we talked about, if there is nothing at the gates, the phase shift between gate and drain is 120, giga, 20, 20 degrees, right? 120 degrees. But the optimum conditions is 160 degrees, right? How can we fix this? We just put inductors at the gate of the transistor. Again, very simple idea, but these inductors at the gate have a huge impact on the fundamental oscillation swing for these transistors. Why? because it just gives the transistor the optimal phase conditions. Okay. So using this topology, we actually made uh, this <coughs> oscillator. These are the measurement setups using power, uh, power meters and harmonic mixers, using the probe and probe stations at uh, 500 gigahertz. We could actually measure this thing, and this is the measurement uh, results at 482 gigahertz. The power measurement using a power meter is around minus 7.9 dBm at 480 gigahertz. And if you just want to get an idea of how this thing is compared to other technologies, you can actually see it in this graph. The best indium phosphide oscillator, which has an Fmax of 800 gigahertz, can produce around minus 10 dBm of power at 480 gigahertz. And to be fair, this is a fundamental oscillator. This is not an harmonic oscillator, because the Fmax is so high that they can just easily create a fundamental oscillator, right? But this design that we did, which is, which is this one, this is at uh, lower frequency using 130 nanometer, this is 65 nanometer at 400 gigahertz. It has a little bit higher power than the indium phosphide uh, oscillator. So if I can have this device of Fmax of 800 gigahertz, I can push the fundamental frequency to go to 400, 500 gigahertz, and I can generate signals at 1.5 terahertz. It's easily possible to do it in a better device with a better Fmax. OK. Any questions so far? OK, so let's move on uh, to another part of our work, which we recently did. Uh, so the, the result of this synthesizer was published last, uh, last spring in ISSCC conference in IC 2014. <clears throat> so the motivation there was, how can we actually synthesize a signal? How can we have oscillators that you can actually swing, uh, you can tune the frequencies easily? The problem with the current technology is you do that using bad actors. Bad actors are basically CMOS transistors that you just connect drain and source together and apply the voltage to the gate and change the capacitance between the gate and drain and source. These are basically just bad actors. And these bad actors are really low quality factor. <coughs> this is the synthesizer block diagram. This is basically a PLL loop. And this is the oscillator part, which is the main part of this uh, work. Uh, what we did was we actually used some of the theories that we had before. We just talked about it, the optimum condition theories. And we also did an interesting design in combining the divider and oscillator together. So it can generate higher power with a wider tuning range in the oscillator. 
Again, we looked at three stage, four stage, different stages for the oscillator. We picked the three stage one because it was closer to the optimum conditions. And then <coughs> we have these lines at the gate uh, or the base of these transistors. Again, the same theory that we just talked about. The interesting part was instead of just putting the vector right at these nodes to change the frequency, we made it a little bit different. And this is how we made it different. So we, we have something called Colpitt's base active vector. And by that, we add a vector right here. So this, if you look at this, this is a Colpitt's, this is a diagram of a Colpitt's oscillator. When you look at the base here, you see a negative resistor plus a vector, plus a capacitor. So if you have a lossy vector here, this Colpitt's block will cancel part of the loss of the vector. And what you see here is basically a pure capacitor. It doesn't introduce any loss to the tank itself, so you can actually have higher and higher frequencies using a crappy bad actor right here. And the same block are used to send the signal to the divider of the next stage. So this is also another thing. So this, this block over here does a lot. This is a buffer, and it's a bad actor at the same time, very low loss bad actor at the same time. And this is basically the block diagram of the divider. I'm not going to go through the details. And again, the same thing. This is a circuit block diagram of the divider. So the signals that we are injecting here are from these top transistors. And this ring over here will oscillate at around 25 kilohertz. So it divides the signal by four. And this is uh, basically kind of the the figure of the layout, if, if, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, this ring outside is the divider. This ring inside is the oscillator. And the oscillator injects the signal to the divider using these active vectors. So using this, we actually implemented this system. And this is a complete synthesizer at 300 gigahertz. And this is the measurement. Uh, setup that we used for this uh, for this system and these are the, the the performance of the VCO the injection lock divider and the frequency synthesizer if you look at the frequency synthesizer the locking range is around 7.9 percent which is way higher than any other technology uh, in the same frequency range so and the frequency range is from 280 years to 303 Yeah, and this is the comparison. You can actually clearly see uh, the difference between uh, these two. So the best synthesizer at around 300 gigahertz is using indium phosphide. And again, look at the tuning range. It's much lower than we implement. Okay. So the next part is basically how to use the same theories that we just talked about in an amplifier. <clears throat> So it's actually great that we have good transistors with very good uh, uh, F-maxes. But the problem is, as you get closer and closer to the F-max of the transistor, the gain, the power gain that you can extract from the transistors are going down, dramatically going down. So because of that, the PAE, which is the efficiency of the transistor, drops dramatically. And sometimes the gain is so low that when you put the matching network and everything around it, you just don't get any gain out of it at all. So it's not an amplifier anymore, right? So the question is, this maximum available gain, I hope you guys know a little bit about, is really low at higher frequencies. So just to give you an example, this is the maximum available gain and maximum stable gain. So this part is maximum available gain, this part is maximum stable gain. Of a, again, 130 nanometer CMOS transistor. You can see as we get closer and closer to the Fmax of the transistor, the, the gain drops dramatically. Like look at look at around 110 gigahertz. So the gain, the maximum available gain is around 2 dB, and when you put the matching network around it, you barely can get any gain out of it. So the question is, is this maximum available gain the highest gain you can get from the transistor? Or is there any other thing that we can do? So let me just give you an overview of what maximum available gain actually is. So the definition of maximum available gain is you take a transistor, which is a two-port network, 
You put a matching network at the input and output, simultaneously match the input and output to the source and load. And then when you do that, the P out over P in is maximum available gain. This is the definition of maximum available gain. And you can actually write down uh, the maximum available gain as a function of the parameters of the two-port device. So it's, it's not a function of the matching network if you assume matching networks are lossless. So you have K, stability factor of this device, and the Y parameters of the device. Okay? So you can actually say what is the maximum available gain of the trans. So this is the maximum available gain. <coughs> so it turns out that other there is something else called maximum achievable gain, which is the fundamental power that you can get out of any device. So the maximum available gain is when you match the input and output. The maximum achievable gain is when you put a network, a passive lossless network, around the device and then match the input and output to the source and load. This is how you can get to the maximum achievable gain, which by definition is the highest possible gain that you can get from any two-port network. Now, the question would be then, what is this linear lossless reciprocal or passive network? That's, that's the question. What, how can we actually design this to get to the port to get the highest power coming out of, power gain coming out of the device? Just to give you a sense, this is the maximum available gain, right? What is the gain here at 100 gigahertz? Around 2, 3, right? Well, what is the maximum achievable gain? It's around 10 dB. So it's just 6 dB higher than the maximum achievable gain. And this is critical when you are close to the maximum uh, oscillation frequency, right? Because here, maximum available gain is nothing. But if you look at the maximum achievable gain, it's significantly higher than, uh, than what you can get from maximum available gain. So again, the question is how to reach maximum achievable gain. And the way that I approach this is very much similar to the way that I approach the maximum power coming out of the device in an oscillator. So the question here is, how can I create the optimum conditions around the device to, maximo to maximize the power gain coming out of the device? In the other one, in the oscillator scenario, it was how to maximize the total power coming out of the device. But in here, it's how to maximize the power gain coming out of it. So these are seems similar, but they're very different in, in equations. So I approach it this way. I actually, again, wrote down the equations for the power of the device. And I found the gain as a function of A and phi, which we talked about. And I found the optimum conditions for A and phi. And in order to find, to, to reach A and phi, one of the easiest way to do this is to put an inductor from drain to the gate of the transistor. If you look at this, you may think that you are basically resonating out CGD of the transistor to get higher gain. But this is partly true. But the problem is, when you do that, the maximum power that you can get is unilateral gain. Unilateral gain is different than maximum achievable gain. And I showed it in the previous, but I didn't talk about it. So here, U is a unilateral gain. Unilateral gain is this graph, and the maximum achievable gain is this graph. So with putting inductor between gate and drain of the transistor, you're actually not resonating out CGD of this transistor. You're making a very interesting feedback from the drain to the gate to reach the maximum possible gain from the transistor. And this is how we can actually show it. You can sweep L, basically 160 picohenry, 120 picohenry, 80 picohenry, and you can see in very narrow part of the frequency, you can reach F -max, G max uh, of the transistor. And this is how we approach this with a better way. Basically, this is too narrow, so we try to make it a little bit wideband, so we can actually implement this. So putting all these things in practice, we implemented this amplifier using the 65 nanometer CMOS transistor at 260 gigahertz. And if you look at these transistors, if you do all the routings, all the EM simulation for the transistor, the F max is around 300, 320 gigahertz. And to be able to get 260 gigahertz amplifier this close, I mean, to the, to the F max of the transistor is interesting. This is the layout. 
And this work was also published in ISSCC a couple of years ago. And this is the measurement results. You can see that at 260 gears, you get around 10 dB of gain. And you can also look at the k-factor, which is the stability criteria, stability figure made for this amplifier, which is well above 1. And these are the power measurements of this. Uh, you can get around minus 3.9 dBm of saturated power at the output at 260 gears using a 65 nanometer CMOS transistor. And this is the comparison that shows its uh, gain and, and especially the power much higher than any other CMOS base uh, amplifier. Okay, so the last part of my talk is on passive networks. So far I was talking about active networks, but this is on the passive networks. This slide is the same thing that you saw in the beginning of the talk. This is a passive Butterworth bandpass filter, and the quality factor is limited to the quality factor of each component. The idea is, is it possible to have an electrical medium? And this medium is electrical medium. It's L and C. You can, you can think about it as transmitter, 2D transmission lines, basically, inductors and capacitors. And you have two mediums. One is this medium, which the signal travels, and one is this medium, which creates that filtering behavior. And the idea is, is it possible to do something like this so that if a signal with different frequencies hits the boundary, different frequencies goes to different directions, right? This is a prism. This is a prism in optics. But we were thinking, is it possible to do this in electronics? And if it is, what, what, how can you do that? Is it, is it useful or, or not? So to do this, I basically delve into finding out the properties of transmission lines and 2D transmission lines. I'm not going to go through these equations here, but I just want to tell you that there are equations governing the direction of the energy in any medium, including the electrical medium of L and C, composed of L and C. So basically find out, uh, these are all equations to find out the direction of the energy, which is the group velocity in these mediums. You find the group velocity, it actually tells you what would be the direction of the energy in these mediums. And you can actually design these two mediums. One is the blue one, one is the red one. They have different inductors and capacitors. And when the signal hits the boundary, you can clearly see that the different frequencies will travel into different directions. This is the graph, the theoretical graph, of how this thing actually happens. This is frequency. This is the transmission angle. So we can see if, let's say, like pick, pick one of the Fs. F is basically the LC ratios of these two mediums. For one F, let's say, let's, let's say this one. When the frequency changes, the direction of the energy changes. What does it mean? It means if you have a signal that has different frequency components in it, different frequencies will travel into different directions. And you can pick up different frequencies at different parts of the lattice. <clears throat> and this is to show, and this is basically simulation again, this is to show that the quality factor, filtering quality factor that you get with this concept is much higher than the quality factor of the LC components that you use in these lattices. And the reason is, the, the whole technique, the whole operation mechanism of these lattices is different than passive filtering. It's basically prism-like filtering. So in this prism-like filtering, the quality factor of the filtering is a very loose function of the quality factor of the component. So if you look at this, the LC section quality factor here is 20. But at 460 gigahertz, you can get the filtering quality factor of the 400, which is much higher than the quality factor of the LC section. This is why this is actually good to use at higher frequencies. So I put this video uh, to just show you how this thing actually happens. So this is the second medium. This is the first medium. Signal travels from left to right, hits the boundary, and you can see what happens to the signal. This is a MATLAB simulation using the theoretical equations. In the left one, you only have 230 gigahertz signal coming in. In this one, you have two frequencies, 245 and 215 gigahertz coming. So in this one, you can see that the signal will travel right here. 
So you can pick up the signal here and there is nothing else going on here. But in this one, you can clearly see there is two different energy at two different frequencies. One travels to this direction, one travels to this direction. So if you put a probe here and here, you can clearly pick up different signals from the two different zones, two different sides of the lens. And this is what we actually implemented. At those days, we didn't really have the technology, we didn't have the equipment to measure at those higher frequencies. So I just wanted to see if the idea works. And I implemented this at uh, 32 to 40 gigahertz. This is the first lattice, this is the second lattice, this is the input pads, and these are the output pads. And if you look at the measured results, you can clearly see that the different frequencies will basically go to different directions. Different, different colors are different points of the lattice. So each port, each point, collects different frequency coming out. Okay, so that was the last part of the talk. I hope I convinced you that uh, there are very much interesting things that is still to be done at CMOS Technologies. You can still uh, get some juice out of CMOS transistors, even at very, very high frequencies. I actually showed oscillators, amplifiers, high power generation at very close to Fmax, wide tuning range frequency synthesizers, even high quality factor filtering can be done at uh, chip level systems, and there are basically a very bright future uh, in this field uh, we, are, we, are, we are witnessing. And just to make it uh, clear, all these ideas are very general, as you, can, as you can imagine. So you can pick different devices in indium phosphide, in gallium arsenide, and try to make the same systems using these ideas and get much better results compared to the CMOS transistor. Thank you. I'd like to go back to your synthesizer for just a moment. Okay. You went through the slides very quickly, but it looked to me like I think you had some data on phase noise. Yes. And it looked like it was pretty dramatically improved. Yes. Uh, it's usually, uh, you're talking about this one? Yeah. Yeah. Improved compared to? Could you comment on that? Yeah. Compared to what? Just your what you think is possible with phase noise and that type of thing. Yeah. Phase noise is, uh, I mean, this is actually one of the reasons, I mean, you, you, you definitely know, but this is the, the main reasons that people use PLLs. Uh, synthesizer right. to reduce the phase noise. In these very high frequency uh, oscillation parts and, and signal generation parts, uh, at higher frequency offsets, you're basically limited to the oscillator itself, which is not very good in, in phase noise. And at the lower part, interestingly, you're limited to the reference. So when you're limited to the reference, and reference is 100 megahertz, then you can get pretty good phase noise at very low offsets. But at higher frequencies, unfortunately, you are limited to the VCO itself, which doesn't really give you that much uh, good of a phase noise. Unless if you can increase your loop bandwidth and get uh, push push the higher offset higher and higher, so you can go go lower. So could it be that in a silicon-based process like CMOS, that you that will always be superior on phase noise as opposed to or compared to trying it in gallium arsenide or indium phosphide? Well. Um, are you talking about high offset or lower offset? High. Higher offset, yeah. Um, depends. Uh, to be honest, the VCOs, the high frequency VCOs in CMOS does, does not have a very good phase noise compared to, let's say, indium phosphide or gallium noise not with good Fmax. And the reason is you have a very good GM in these transistors, and the GM itself gives you a push, a dramatic push in phase noise. So. If you compare two CMOS, basically if you compare CMOS with indium phosphate with the same Fmax, then probably yes, you probably get a better phase noise in CMOS. But when you compare a CMOS transistor with Fmax of 300 GHz with an 800 GHz indium phosphate, I don't think it can uh, stand the challenge. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, no yes. Yeah, in the case of variable control oscillators, uh, you are using I think the varactor to change the thing, right? Yes. But how? Easily, how, how workable is it now when you are doing that, and how, how do you do the how do, you, do we change and so on so that you can have sort of like a controllable type of uh, you know change? Yes, yes. Yeah. So yeah. this is actually uh, the the main reason that people use the loops, the PLL loops. Yes. So if the varactors here, I mean, I have varactors in the loop here. 
these van actors get the control voltage from the loop. Right. And you, you feed back the frequency to this uh, phase and frequency detector with the, with the reference here. So the dynamic of the loop will force the frequency of the VCO to be a very specific frequency, right? Now, if you want to change the frequency here, you only you can change the reference. If you change the reference, the, the frequency of the oscillator will will uh, will follow the frequency of the reference, or you can change the control voltage of this divider. So you can change the dividing ratio, and then you can get uh, different frequencies at the output. So you can very well control the output of this loop uh, using the system. Are there any uh, questions? Any other questions? Yes. Who's making the Indian phosphide transistors at the 800 gigahertz FNS? Yeah, that's a good question. So there are multiple different companies that are doing that these days. Uh, one of them is Teledyne. So these are uh, the, the main uh, company that do that. And I think they also give you the transistor. So you can actually design it, but the price is really high. Uh, Northrop Grumman also is the company that does Indian phosphide. So these are the two main companies that are working primarily on uh, Indian phosphide technology. And they're way ahead. I mean, I think, I don't know if you have heard, um, I think it was two months ago that they reported, I think it was Northrop Grumman that reported a one terahertz Indian phosphide amplifier uh, with, with DARPA funding. So they're, they're reaching very high Fmax uh, in Indian phosphide. Yeah. Yes? On your prism filter, Yes. during the simulations, what kind of attenuations do you get? Yeah, even in the measurement, I can tell you the attenuation okay. is huge. And the reason is this signal should travel to LC, through the LC sections, right? And at lower frequencies, it's terrible. So if you look at those inductors, those are big inductors, right? So when the signal passes through that, you get 10, 15 dB of uh, attenuation going through that. But the hope is, when the frequency goes higher and higher, these inductors get smaller and smaller. Quality factor of the inductors goes higher and higher. And at the same time, you can have a very small lattice instead of a big, like 100 by 100 lattice. And therefore, the attenuation is kind of controllable or it's, it's acceptable. But these kind of filters, it's really, I, I cannot really envision it to be used in receivers when you need a good phase, uh, noise figure. This is where you amplify the signal, and now you, you want to have a very good filter, but with a, with a high attenuation. OK, uh, since some of you have classes uh, starting at 6 o'clock, uh, let's stop now. And then I'd like to talk uh, to uh, thank uh, Dr. Uh, Momeni for giving us such a, such an interesting and also uh, instructive, really, it was really instructive for me to do this. So uh, let's give him a, a hand then, and then uh, I'm, I'm going to invite you to, to the pizza. Let's go. All right.